15 million adults are affected with major depression in the United States each year. Depression is widespread and is even more on the rise in 2023 due to the devastating effects of the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic. There is a 1,000% increase in calls to federal emergency hotlines for people in distress in April of 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. You guys have heard me talk about the issues of anxiety and depression on the show. Today, we're going to come at it from the perspective of those who are caring for people who are struggling with anxiety and depression. Uh, this is going to be a great conversation with my friend Carol Letham, and we're going to be hitting this thing right head on. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, for those of you who are new to the show, welcome to the intersection of faith and culture. My name is Heidi St. John, and I'm going to be talking today with my guest about a very important topic, and that is the topic of depression. A lot of people struggle with this, struggle with anxiety, struggle with depression. I mean, I hear from you every single week at the Heidi St. John podcast. If you've listened to my show for any length of time, then you know that I struggle with anxiety having come out of an abusive environment for most of my adult life. And I speak to that in my book, Becoming Mom Strong. And also I believe in the healing power of God. And uh, I've talked about essential oils. We're gonna hit all that stuff today. But what I wanted to say at the outset of this show is if you are struggling with anxiety or you're struggling with depression, I hope you'll lean in because I really do believe that God has healing for you. And hopefully this uh, this show is gonna go a long way and bring you guys some hope and some encouragement. So Carol Ethan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm happy that you're here. Uh, I met you obviously here at the at the National Religious Broadcasters. I mean, there's so much going on. Uh, this environment is just electric. I think I've done somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 interviews uh, from the floor here, and I'm I'm really interested. I mean, we've got, we have a lot of people, as you can imagine, to come up and say, "Hey, I have a book. What about this?" And there's just a limited a, a number of slots that we have to do interviews. But yours really caught my attention because I think that this is one of the defining issues that we're facing in the culture right now, right? Especially in the wake of the uh, of the pandemic yes. and the lockdowns, mm-hmm. the criminal way that our government handled yes. uh, the Rona, as I affectionately like to call it. I know, yes. Uh, and I'm curious to know, I mean, it, it takes a lot. And I just said this to another uh, gal who was on my show earlier today. Books do not simply write themselves. No. You have to have a lot of passion uh, to write a book. And not only are you writing a book about a really difficult subject, <laughs> you're writing a book about your husband's yes. struggle yes. with depression, even more uh, challenging, I think. So why did you decide to be so transparent about his struggle with depression? Well, he was a pastor and we had been married for 40 years when he when the anxiety became depression overnight mm. and the depression overnight became suicidal tendencies and i found myself losing my identity one night in early 2016 even before the rona came mm-hmm. <laughs> onto our lives he ended up having to be in a psychiatric hospital wow and the next morning i was well after I got kicked out of the hospital because in California we have a code called the 5150, which is basically they take your loved one and they put them in psychiatric jail. You have no rights. You can say nothing. For 36 hours, I didn't know where he was. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. I was escorted out of the emergency room at with an armed guard. Hey, and we're from the government. We're here to help. I know. Not. I know. Unbelievable. And I was the next morning I was sitting there and I found myself going, who do I call? Who do I trust with this information? In the church, as a pastor, who's going to be safe? Who can? Who's going to help me? And over the course of the next few months, as he began to really struggle and it became public, I wrote a blog. I was already a speaker. I was already a blogger. I was already traveling all over. People knew me because of my background um, of abuse as a child. And I had promised God I would be transparent. Wow. And God said, girl, yeah, get out there. I- I'm, I'm curious because... I- It sounded like for the first, you know, 39 years of your marriage, your husband was fine. He was. And he wasn't struggling with this. Did you see it coming? Did you, was it sort of a slow buildup? What happened? I have a quote in my book by Kierkegaard that says, life must, life can only be understood forwards, but I mean backwards, but it can only be lived forwards. And so now that I'm standing on this side of it and I'm looking back. I'm all of a sudden aware of this and this and, oh, that's what this was. And he had always struggled with some control issues and little anxiety issues. 
but nothing to the extent. But it was a slow build, like yeah. you said, slow build. And one day it just the dam broke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, and I we I asked you this right before we started recording because hello, <laughs> uh, your husband. I mean, you're you're writing about your husband. It's yes. one thing to write about your struggle. I mean, uh, certainly when I wrote about my abusive background, I actually went to all of my siblings because me, you know, that's my story, but it's also partly their story. Mm -hmm. And I had to have their blessing. I went to my mom and I said, this is what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. This is even a bigger, more bigger deal than that. And yeah. your husband not only gave you the blessing to write about his struggle with depression, but he wrote the forward for the book. Yes, he did. And every day, like I've been here and he's been asking me, whose marriage did you save today? Uh, you know, who did you talk to today? Who's going to who's going to feel better? And I've actually, as I've wandered around the showroom floor, I've actually given away quite a few books to people who have spouses who struggle just because they ask me about the book. I begin to talk about the book. And then one person, their eyes even teared up because they're in the throes of just chaos and mess and ready to throw in the towel. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, there's somebody else who knows what it feels like to love someone who struggles like this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, uh, you know, I guess if I could be bold like this, well, it's me, so I will be bold. Yeah. I, I have no other way of living life. Uh, your marriage, I mean, I've, I've walked through some, I mean, I've, Jay and I, my husband, I've been married for coming up on 34 years. And we've said publicly one of the hardest years of our marriage was the twenty our year of our twenty fifth wedding anniversary. I think people think, oh, if you can just get past seven years, if you can just and life is always throwing stuff at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, our struggle really came because life was shifting. Yeah, right. So his role was shifting, my role was shifting. I just wanted to go back to the way that it was, but God was saying, no, I'm going to move you to a different place. And I'm curious. I'm only imagining. And I think I'm probably right that your marriage really suffered. I mean, this had to have hurt you deeply. It still is. Yeah. It still is. And basically the commitment is there. I had to come to a place where I had to say, I made a vow before God in sickness and in health, mm -hmm. in, in for richer, for poorer. And this is the sickness part. And this is the poorer part. And I, God is not giving me permission to break that vow. Now, I also want to say that is not true for everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want your listeners to think that I'm saying you can never walk away from a marriage, but a marriage is nine times more likely to fail mm -hmm. if depression is part of the mix. Mm -hmm. And I just knew from the beginning that we had been married for 40 years and I had heard God so I, in the book I share a story about the day I saw him and God said, you're going to marry that man before I ever met him. Wow. And I go back to that moment and I go, if God was right then, he's still right now. Yeah. And the other thing that I say, the very last part of the book is I don't, I stay because I don't want him to become the responsibility of my children. And I stay because I want my children to see what it looks like to walk through something so hard and yet you still have that love and commitment to each other. Yeah. And marriage is hard. Ugh. I mean, come on. I always tell people, if you've been married more than five minutes, then you know. Yeah. <laughs> the marriage is hard. This this obviously adds a, a level to it. I know that there are a lot of people that are listening to this right now who have children that are struggling mm -hmm. with anxiety or depression. Or maybe they're the ones who are struggling or mm -hmm. they have a, a spouse or... Uh, and I'm wondering if you can walk us through some of the things that, that would offer them some hope and some help. So let's let's take that angle first, uh, talking to the person who is the one struggling, okay. and then let's talk to the caregiver because okay. I would imagine they're very different, yeah. different prescriptives. So from the person who's struggling, you need to learn to trust and you need to be willing to listen to your doctors and your loved one, who is your caregiver. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest issues that I see my husband struggling with is that he, it's hard because especially as a man, oh, yeah. he feels like he's lost control. his control. Yeah, yeah. And control happens to be his, his, tar his button. Mm -hmm. You know, control happens to be, if I can control this, then it will be okay. So you have to be willing to trust doctors. You have to be willing to ask for help. And you have to be willing to hear the hard things when I say to my husband you know you're being really cruel to me right now because his manifests itself as anger and blame towards me mm -hmm. 
And so you're the, you're the safe person. Because uh, I mean, honestly, that's what it is. I always like to tell people, you know, we're the more the most cruel. I tell this to mothers all the time whose children lash out at them. Mm -hmm. Your son just lashed out at you because you're not leaving. Right. He knows that he can he can give full vent to his anger or whatever it is because you're the safe person to do that. But man, that's rough. It is. And and I have developed um, you know, switching to the caregiver side of it. I have developed some really cool techniques that um, I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago and the podcaster, the gentleman said, oh, we're going to we're going to rename that the blue tape box therapy because I actually one day was in the garage and I was just having a pity party and I was literally verbally screaming at God, this is not fair. I didn't sign up for this. Mm -hmm. How can you treat me this way? He's supposed to love me. He's supposed to cherish me. This is not happening. And I looked over and there was a workbench with some blue tape and a measuring tape. And I taped off a three foot by three foot square on the garage floor. And I started screaming. I don't even know what the neighbors must have thought because I'm sure they could hear me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a crazy woman in the garage. <laughs> and I'm please. like screaming. And I'm like, God, do you see this box? And I'm like sobbing and I'm crying. And I'm like, do you see this box? I'm stepping into this box. I'm going to step in this box right now. And everything inside of that box, which is nothing, is all I can deal with. And I'm going to step in that box. And when I step in that box, you are going to take care of everything else outside of that box. Mm -hmm. And I literally, while I'm screaming and crying, stepped into the box. And I said, okay, here I am. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, it's about time. Wow. It's about time, Carol. You're not supposed to take care of all this stuff out here. That's my job. Wow. And that right there, you can use that particular there. And I still have the blue box on my garage floor. And I have drawn that blue box in many locations Wow! when I, when I need to remind myself that God is in control, not me. Yeah. I think it, it's difficult. I mean, I've had uh, people in my life that struggle with various forms of anxiety, depression, a lot of times fueled by insecurity mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and we'll get on, you know, the medicine gets adjusted or whatever happens. And then that person feels better. And then they decide, Oh, I feel better. I don't need this anymore. And so that, and then you're in this constant sort of up and down cycle of I was better and now I'm worse. And I, but the one who's getting tossed around is the caregiver, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and it is a cycle. Mm -hmm. And I have, I mean, I have strategies that I use when we're having a good day. I don't worry about tomorrow. I don't worry about five minutes from now because it can shift just like that. Mm -hmm. If I'm having a good moment, I live in that moment mm -hmm. and I enjoy that moment. And moving in with our daughter um, helped us financially because he had to retire at 62 oh, wow. and he was not even close to retirement age. And he and I lost overnight. I lost my identity as a wife and a pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, I'm trying to figure out who I am. And but moving in with our daughter created this incredible relationship with our nine year old grandson I who bet. lives through the kitchen door. Mm -hmm. And HB doesn't understand what's going on with Poppy. He doesn't know the story. He walks through the kitchen door and he sees someone that he loves and adores. And he will take his blanket at nine years old and he'll crawl up onto the couch and he'll say, can I watch TV? And he'll just lean over against my husband. I would imagine husband. this is healing for your oh, husband. It is so healing. I would imagine uh, in the last few years of uh, my my father-in-law's life, we had, we had a, a little girl. Um, we still have her, but she was a baby. And, and he was struggling with chronic, chronic mm -hmm. illness, uh, kidney disease, and he's so frustrated with life, mm -hmm. you know, because it just didn't seem fair to be in pain all the time and not do the things you want to do. And she would go down there in the morning because they live with us and mom still does. But Sailor would go down there in the morning and just grandpa and she would sit down and they would watch, you know, uh, you know, Bonanza or mm -hmm. something. And I saw it change him. Yes. Uh, there's a softening that, mm -hmm. that, that happens. If I'm watching TV, we have we live in a small two-bedroom apartment attached to the house. If HB opens the kitchen door, I will turn, I will, I will say, I'm gonna go in the other room and watch TV. I will literally get up off the couch and I will go in the other room so that he can crawl on the couch because I see that as God's gift yeah. of healing for him. And that's just one, you know, one small blessing. But then I also, you can't, as a caregiver, you start to see the signs, like they get on the medication and things are going smooth and then they feel better and they want to get off the medication. Right. And when that starts happening, you can't, I can't control, he's an adult. So That's I right. can't say you have to keep taking this. And so what's happened is as, as hard as this is for me, 
he now believes that he takes his medication to calm me down. And I say, thank you for doing that. I don't get upset. I don't get frustrated because the most important thing is he needs that medication. And that's been the other hard thing is that in the world of church work, we don't always like you, you know, there are holistic and there are other options, but for him, none of that has worked. Mm. And so we do have to go the medication route. And it's been very difficult because we have been told that he doesn't have enough faith. We've been told that he has hidden sin. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I hate, well, I hate it for a hundred different reasons. And I've talked about this on, on my show many times. Uh, you know, my struggle with anxiety was so severe. And it, it's funny because God's done some sort of crazy healing in my mm-hmm. life because here I've, you know, I've run for Congress. I haven't been <laughs> on medication now for many years. But there were, there were seasons in my life mm-hmm. when I'd be standing in the kitchen, you know, making spaghetti and everything's fine. I got a million kids running around me and all of a sudden this crippling anxiety. My mm-hmm. heart is racing. I don't know why. Yeah. And, uh, and God in his mercy and over time yeah. has really healed me from that, you know, uh, mentally, certainly, mm-hmm. physically, in many, many ways. And, and I, a lot of that I credit to you. Uh, natural mm-hmm. remedies, you know, essential oils. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I don't go anywhere without them. But I also recognize there was a season in which that medication was life saving. And I and and the the audacity <laughs> of believers to say, well, that's just you know, that's that's God's punishment, or you must have a sin issue, or whatever that is. We would never say that to someone who was uh, taking insulin because they were a diabetic. Exactly. But somehow you've got a mental illness, which is it really is a mental illness. Mm-hmm. And we've stigmatized it. I do think the stigma is getting better. I don't think it's as bad as it was, but it just needs to stop already. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that there's a fear. What I think happens is uh, the question that I got in the early days was how could this happen? There's a whole chapter in there called how could this happen to Bill? Yeah. How could this happen to him? How could this happen to him? And I think that people are afraid. If it could happen to him, he was a very prominent, very involved Southern Baptist pastor in California. Mm-hmm. And then one night and over day, he was gone. That's crazy. And people are like, what happened? And I think there's a fear that they can't, they, they, that it could happen to them. Mm-hmm. There's a fear that it's not explainable. And then I use an experience I had with a neurologist and neurologies, I, I think it's an incredible Have profession. Have you ever met a neurologist that you liked? No. No. I, I, I'm telling I you. I was trying to be very really nice about no, what I'm about to say. It's a very special person. So. Okay, so wait. I have a friend whose husband is a neurologist who actually I do like a lot. Probably because he's not my actual doctor. I need his number. Yeah, yeah I should give it to you. But I met a, a neurologist that I actually like. But everybody that I met. Uh, when I was when I was trying to figure out what's wrong with my head and my heart, they were just they were just so uh, they I were just asked, crazy. I ended up taking, for the bedside manners. Yeah, I'll just say that. Well, I ended up taking him to a private clinic, and I paid a fortune. I went into yeah, debt yeah. to pay for to take him to a private clinic. Yeah, yeah. And they did all of this stuff, and they were the clinic. When when our regular physicians could not come up with an answer, this clinic was able to give me a medication within forty eight hours that calmed the suicidal issues and leveled him off. But when I tried to take those findings back to the neurology program at my medical place, they would not look at them. They would not consider them. And when we were sitting one time talking to a neurologist and I was begging him, can you just look at his brain and see what part of his brain is broken? And Heidi, this is what he said to me, just stone faced, not without an autopsy. Oh, well, that's what I mean. <laughs> and I was See, like, who was like, did you just say not without an Oscar? I'm mean. like, uh, oh, man. And then I had another neurologist tell me that I needed counseling. And I said, well, at well, that point, you probably did. I was already, and I, my response to him was, you, I'm in counseling. I know. Were you like, thank you, and you're not helping? Yeah, no. You know, obviously, I'm on the floor here, and I'm being told I have to uh, wrap oh, it up. Sorry. But I, I want to. I want to know, okay, so let people know where they can find you, because I think for anybody who's ever taking care of someone who is struggling with anxiety or depression, this is going to be a really great tool in their toolbox Mm -hmm. because you're giving, you're not just sharing stories, but Mm -hmm. you're giving tools. Absolutely. Ways, practical ways for people to help those who are struggling with this. And I so appreciate that you're, that you're still in the fight because your marriage is worth fighting for your husband's worth fighting for you clearly love each other. Absolutely. And I actually am looking forward to just hearing 
what my friend would call a glory story that God uh, <laughs> writes in your life. Where can people find your book? Um, they can find it at my website, Carol with an E. So my name is Carol with an E, um, Carol's journey.com. So it's C A R O L E S J O U R N E Y.com. And there's a link on there with my book. All right. So Carol's journey.com. Carol Lethem, what a, pr- a privilege to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you for speaking into this important conversation. Thank you. And I hope to catch up with you later. Thank you. If you guys want more information on today's guests, just hop on over to HeidiStJohn.com and click on the podcast notes. I hope that you're listening carefully because for those of you who are struggling with this, with suicidal ideation, with depression, with anxiety, God's heart is for you. There is help available. Don't give up. Reach out and get the help that you need. And, uh, and we would love to hear your stories right here at the Heidi St. John podcast. If you guys have questions or comments, you want to reach out to me, HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll see you right back here again at the intersection of faith 